In fact, remind me, Trevor. Trevor, before I get started on these, like, because I'm going to show some like trailers of movie think, clips and stuff, make sure I turn my thing off, because otherwise there'll probably just be some little piece or something in one little video. Yeah. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Have attention, please. All quiet, please. Thank you. Go ahead, have your notes out. We're going to continue on with World War II today, and we'll be continuing with World War II as well on Thursday. Um, next week, as I understand it quite clearly, on Tuesday. Lucky you. You had an extra one. So, continuing on, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, next week on Tuesday, when you guys come into the building, you guys are going to be doing the. SAT, okay? That's all you'll be doing. As I understand it, because we got the email from Mr. Pettit uh, yesterday um, or sometime recently, you guys do it, I guess it's in the morning, wherever, I think in the cafeteria. Um, and then after you're done, you're done for the rest of the day because that is such an onerous task for you. So we wouldn't want you to have to do any education after the SAT. So Tuesday of next week. Yeah. Yeah, so like your first and second period that you would have me and Mrs. Rao and so forth, I think that's when you're going to be doing the SAT, but to the extent that it overflows a little bit, you're still not going to have to do your third and fourth period class. So I will see you, Gavin uh, and Garen and Noah and everyone else, on Thursday. And I already ch I made that change. I forgot to like tell you guys all about it, but I po I've changed it all over the place and all the various different notifications. Your quiz on Chapter 35... Um, is on Thursday of next week, okay? So be ready for that. It's interesting because I was looking over the different kind of things on there and I'm like, okay, that's definitely from the textbook, although there's quite a few of the different items that have percolated up through uh, in the regular note-taking material. So, but go over that. It should be fairly uh, doable to prepare for it. Not a bad idea to go ahead and write that down. That's a 15 one? Yeah, 15 points. To write down the two sentences for each of the different things, you can turn that in, and then you've got that ready to go. That's going to be part of your, um, part of your grade, one and a half points. Okay. Um, very shortly thereafter, we'll be uh, focusing on the Holocaust, if we haven't already by that time. And then, yeah, we'll be uh, showing Schindler's List in a series of 90-minute classes. I think it'll take just over two classes to go through the entire thing. Already checked with Mrs. Rao. I'm anticipating there might be one or two of you guys. Same thing for the other section that uh, we'll choose not to, um, which is fine. And she will have room in her classroom in the back for you to hold up there. Um, your requirement, though, is to watch the documentary about Oscar Schindler. So, I mean, it doesn't have quite... It's not so much that there's going to be a lot of gore and everything. It's just that you know, if when you get attached to different characters in the story of the Schindler's List and so forth, when you get to know them as real people, and then you've got this impending doom thing, as in Hitler wants to kill you, that creates a real sense of, you know, or, and, you know, and I know some of you guys are really sensitive. When I was, actually still a little bit, uh, but I, when I, w I remember like as a young teen, um, the 1970s, they had all these like disaster movies. You know, it just it was a big thing. Yeah, it was like um, Poseidon Adventure. You were on a cruise ship and it flipped over and they're all trying to make their way up to the bottom, which is the top of the ship now, to escape. Or the towering inferno. You're in a skyscraper and the flames are moving up and so forth. It was intense. I mean, it was like, oh my gosh, this is a little bit too much. I'm okay now. But, um, <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, that was a big earthquake. I think that was another disaster movie that came out. You watch them now and you're like, oh, those are hokey. You know, the special effects aren't. You know, great, but they were great for movies back then. And just the whole thing and the music and everything. Holocaust? Steven Spielberg? Yeah. You guys are going to be fortunate that you're actually not sitting through the whole thing, you know, three hours, whatever, straight. It'll have a little bit of a break there. But you guys, yeah, you guys, you guys survived the, the um, Rape of Nanking documentary. And actually, before that, I'll be showing you a 1970s documentary on the Holocaust, which is pretty intense, because you're going to hear right from the mouths of people who were there describing it, actually. And I'll even tell you some of my stories about being in a gas chamber. 
when I took students to Europe. And we went to Auschwitz. And we, it was intense. If you weren't prepared going in, there was one of the moms that was with us. She was not prepared for what she was going to see. So we, we were in a room and she saw children's clothes and she broke down. Because these were the children's clothes that were gathered up by Jewish children uh, when they were being processed at the death camp. The clothes were all set aside and the children were taken into the gas chambers. So, yeah, it's very intense. When you're standing in a room and having somebody explain what that room was used for during the time of the Holocaust, and you're looking at the walls. Anyway, I'll tell you that later. But And there's evidence of the walls of people's last moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because if you're in a place and you have any sense of like what kinds of things have ever happened in that place, yeah, so anyway. But it's all good, all part of your education. It's going to be great. Um, shall we do the pledge? Okay, let's go ahead and do the pledge. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll give you a little bit more time, Aiden, to get through the ch- and take your hat off, you know, whatever, you know, works for you. Aiden's like, I'm knocking chairs over, you know. I don't think you got anything on Colin Kaepernick or so forth when it comes to, you know. It's like, I'm going to keep my hat on, I'm going to knock chairs over, but I don't mean to do any of that. So, anyway, um, announcements, student council. If they're doing the scavenger hunt, Maya, what should they do? Because I've had a couple of inquiries. I don't know. They were trying to get started on it. And I'm like, well, I think you're going to come in here eventually, maybe a few times. Oh, the first clue? What is the first clue? Oh, and so you go there and you find something written. Okay, so you actually have to, so whatever clues are in here are related to things that are near the number. Okay. That leads to that. And then you keep following that until you finally get to the last one. How many stops along the way are there? Eight? Okay, cool. All right. All right, eight. So get that first one. Uh, updates in uh, sports. Track. How's track doing? Good. Do you guys do well? Any detail? Oh, you got one today. Okay. And you've already had one? Okay. Yeah. And I know, I don't think there's any, are there any 11th graders on baseball? Not in here. Okay. And they're doing great. I guess they just keep beating teams. I mean, they came out of nowhere and then just like, and everyone's going home crying, I guess, for all their opponents and so forth. Seriously, I mean, and golf has gotten going. What's, what's the scoop on golf? Oh, yeah. You have a first official tournament? Who, who's that with? Eight other schools. Okay, good luck. You guys feeling good about it? We'll see. The weather's nice. The links are green, I guess. More or less. Okay. Uh, any other announcements? Okay. All right. Um, have your notes out. We're going to get into back into, um, I think we got, we were talking about Alan Turing, right? And how he and his team were very clever at figuring out how to break the Enigma code. It's always fascinating because I, I think my uncle, um, who was married to my mom's sister, the one whose husband was killed uh, in North Africa by a French truck driver because they had to have all the lights out, and, so, and then whose children escaped being bombed by the Germans. It's like, wow, life is really quite interesting when major war comes along kind of shakes things up. But I think her second husband ended up going to work for a really, really secret agency, and you couldn't talk about 
what it was you actually did uh, during the war. And that was kind of like some of the stuff that was going on um, in uh, uh, that Alan Turing and so forth was involved in. As in, you know, we can't talk about it. It was always fascinating, like reading the different things, like my dad's letters when he went away to all the naval training and so forth. He's kind of like, we can't talk about this, we can't talk about that. But it just sort of gives you a little bit of a sense of kind of what's going on, but they try to keep secrets, okay? Um, before we get to that, I want to share some news with you. Some of it's like new news and some of it's old news, but I would say probably most of you guys will ratchet it up as fairly as fitting in the good category. So the first piece um, that most of you guys are aware of, certainly those who are doing capstone, good news as far as graduation requirements, they're a bit different certainly going into next year as far as what you have to have as a requirement. Uh, a lot more flexibility with respect to capstone. You guys know if you're in capstone, you have an opportunity next year to get started on your internship earlier for each day, as in you, don't have, you have an opportunity of not having a fourth period. You guys are aware of that. I think Mrs. Anderson came in about a month ago or so and talked to you guys about that. You have the option of um, not having like two years of the IB history, which is, has been a requirement in the past, but that makes it a little bit easier for you guys to do the internship or whatever options. That is an option, um, and it was important for me to know that kind of going into next year as well as Mrs. Anderson to figure out what schedule is going to look like. It looks like rather than like two sections of 12th grade IB history, there'll be one. There'll be two sections of IB English because you do have a four-year requirement statewide, and the only English you're going to be having offered here in this building is going to be Mrs. Rao's IB English. And so you'll, that will definitely continue preparing you for what comes up next. Um, as far as the history goes, you've got options. And it sounded like, as a result of, her, of the survey that she shared, uh, the vast majority of the capstone students are going to opt to. And you can change your mind. Uh, and, at, and some students in the other class, I think, were asking me questions as far as, like, you know, what are the implications and so forth. Yeah, you still have to finish out the, the, um, the IEA. That'll be, like, that's in the bank. Uh, but for those students, I think there's a handful of students who are interested in continuing on with IB history. Um, you will be prepared by the end of your senior year for success on the IB exams. In fact, you're going to be in great shape on that. Because of the next, and any questions or comments on that? Okay. Okay, and, and feel free to, I know I've had some conversations with the students kind of clarifying like, what about this, what about that? I think, I think there'll be some opportunity for people to pursue if they wanted to, like a CWI credit in history, whatever, if they wanted to. Those going for the IB diploma, your path has been set forth. I mean, that's been something that has been created for quite some time as far as the different options and so forth available. The next piece of news is something that yesterday I'm like, I need to find this out. And so I dug and dug and dug and found out something that's really good news. Okay, this is for all of you guys who are taking any IB class. So this is actually applies to everybody, whether you're going IB diploma or, or a mixture of, you know, IB English and maybe, you know, one or two other classes. You guys are impacted by the whole COVID and quarantine thing, right? Uh, you've been impacted this year, your junior year, and the IB diploma program is a two-year program. The students who are taking the exam this year, IB toned it down a bit um, in recognition of the fact that a lot of students are not getting nearly as much face-to-face, -face, even like online uh, time. It's, it's impacting their, their, their education. So they've toned the exams down a bit and you really have to talk to each individual IB instructor to see exactly how that plays out. For my class, this year, seniors, for paper two, instead of take, doing two essays, they do one, which really is great as far as, like, there's a whole unit we don't even have to do because they're going to be well prepared getting ready for paper two. They write one essay. Paper three, instead of writing three essays, they're only writing two. Okay? It also alleviates some of the stress on that. They're doing that for next year as well. It's very good news. Yeah, I mean, I sent that out um, to Miss Holiday, and she sent that out to the IB teachers and so forth. 
because, yeah, I mean, even this year, there's going to be some places in the United States and Britain and some other parts of the world that aren't going to be sitting down for IB exams. Our student, the students here, they're going to. I mean, they'll all be in here at other parts of the building, um, you know, doing their IB exams and so forth. But that's really good news for you guys, because I know some of you guys, maybe some in the other class have asked me, you know, are we going to be okay going into next year's exams, given that, even right now, now that you're back in school full time, you're not, you're back in school 80% of the time. I know it feels like a lot more, trust me, um, but you're still only back in school 80% more. So the good news is, like, you're in great shape certainly for a history class. In fact, you're probably in better shape than even students in previous years because by the end of this year, you'll have an IB, an IA in the bank. And honestly, you know, it's like, and you've got an incentive because it's like 100 points toward the grade for this semester. That's a big, big thing. You want to do really well on that, and that's the payoff is it helps your grade this semester as well as you don't have to mess with it next year. Bless you. Um, if you are in the IB Diploma Program or if you're among those handful of students that want to take my class next year in order to be eligible for the certificate. So, good news. And you can ask each of the different teachers like how that's going to impact you, but it's nice, okay? I don't know if you realize that, but it's really nice and it's a big relief for the teachers as well. Gosh, I think, I've, I think you're actually in pretty good shape on history. Um, you can go over the stuff. I think, you know, even with all, even right now, like students have an opportunity, if they want to, they can go in and, you know, review like the, the videos, which is not a bad thing. It's a pretty complete set. And I'm continuing to do those just because, I, mostly not so much for you guys, because Adrian was the last one of your class that was still doing at home and now everyone is here. But frankly, for future classes so that they have those, and for old people that like to watch my videos because, like, you know, I've got, like, literally, I've got about 100 subscribers, and there's people that chime in. Yeah, I have to look this up. I still don't know what the acronym, I don't know the letters. I always forget the letters, but some of my 10th graders are like, well, when you retire, you should make these sort of kind of videos. And I'm like, is that good or bad? And what, most of the students are like, oh, it's okay. My daughter was like, yeah, I don't know if you really want And I actually watched them. It's like the AS something, something, whatever. And they're like, oh, my gosh, yeah. I love the parody ones. When I looked at it, the parody ones were great. Those are hilarious. But the ones were like, you've got a really soft-spoken person, and, and here's a feather, and here's this. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, my gosh. This generation is into some really, shall we say, creative things. So... I don't know. It's just kind of interesting. It's like with anything. Some of the, some of the offshoots are like, don't want to go there. Yeah. So, so any questions about like uh, the IB exam changes going into next year? You, 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 that's good. Yes. So the preparation for the history part is a lot of essay stuff. And one, we've held off on that a little bit more this year. Even though traditionally most of the essay preparation is done like in April of the senior year. Like the seniors are getting ready to just come in here and just write essay after essay after essay. They will be calibrated. Those students who are not going to be in this class next year, you don't have to mess with that part. You, I think we've done one essay in class. Uh, but it's mostly like the calibration. The key thing is, <laughs> as you guys are well aware of, it's very important, as I've said, to know the details, because you can't write a good essay unless you have details. You know, you can't just get up and say, this guy had a dream, gave a speech, and then blacks could vote. It's not as simple as that, okay? Details matter, okay? Um, if there is, and I don't, frankly, I don't, it's going to be a rare student here as an 11th grader that still goes through the entire year and doesn't IA. But the good news is if you still needed to work on your IA some next year for history, you could do that, but it's kind of like on your own because the, uh, the, the, the scores, the predicted scores and so forth, don't get sent in until later on. Although, frankly, in the past, the predicted scores mattered a great deal because they just took a sample. Now, they take everyone's IA. They're uploading everyone. 
So it's kind of like, takes a lot of pressure off the teachers. It's like, I don't know, this is what I give them, but <laughs> you give them what you're going to give them because you're going to anyway, you know, when you send them off to Zimbabwe or whoever, you know, place around the world that is like grading those things. Yeah. The Wakanda, yes. You're getting to know it right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in fact, <clears throat> yeah, I did a, a massive amount of, this is something you guys will get next year. And these are, since 2011, these are all the questions that have been given on the IB exam relative to the various different topics. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's like, it, it gives you the sense, like Cold War questions and so forth are there. Um, so you know the topics ahead of time. I know it's kind of weird because I give you these things and you're, you're like, what is all that nonsense about paper two, topic 11? When you actually get to doing the essays, the exams, you'll have a massive amount of questions and you'll skip through most of the ones in the beginning because they're like early history. You don't mess with those. You hone in on the ones that you've uh, covered, you've studied, and you'll pick the ones that work best for you. Seriously. I mean, it's kind of like, and that's part of the main goal of, my goal of preparation, is I want to prepare you for a whole bunch of topics and questions, and you decide what the ones you're best at. So if you, I mean, maybe next year we do the Mexican Revolution, but I've had sometimes students who are like, I like that Mexican Revolution question. Oh, I like both of those. And they'll do both of those. And other students are like, eh, I don't feel as good about that. Gives them a lot of choice. So you'll be prepared you will be well prepared for that. And along those lines, um, something that I've had very, very much on my mind and my heart um, for quite some time, and I think in all, all likelihood, I just, I can't imagine too many scenarios where it would turn out otherwise. You guys know, you've heard me say this before, I want to get back to writing, and I am going to get back to writing as soon as I can actually like, be in a position where I'm going to retire. So I've got one more year. Okay? Yeah, one more year. And it will be, like I say, in all likelihood. So for those of you guys who are doing IB history next year, I'll be your teacher. I'll get you across the line, the finish line. So there literally will be, in all the craziness, this way, that way, and so forth, two classes of students that I will have had as freshmen all the way through senior year. Ironically, Cadence, one of them is your sister's, because that was the first year I taught the ninth grade one, and then after she, at her graduating class, I quit. Didn't make enough money, came back. And then I started with you guys when you were ninth graders, and I'll finish up with you with, in the ninth grade. And uh, some of you, occasionally I get some students, I can't remember who, they're like, well, you gotta have my sister or brother in the ninth grade, and I'm thinking, I don't know, but I talked to Ms. Anderson about like next year's schedule and so forth, and it's pretty clear that next year's schedule for me is going to look very much like this year. So I'll have one section of seniors, two juniors, two uh, sophomores, and then half of the ninth grade class like I do right now. So I've got half of those ninth graders and so forth there. So there you go. And that's actually good timing because Mrs. Rao I was talking with yesterday, and <coughs> most of you guys apparently <coughs> did turn in your EE paperwork, although I guess there's nine that haven't yet. But anyway, I don't know who those people are. But <coughs> yeah, so, so it's good because it's like, oh my gosh, last year the seniors are like, I want Mr. Hansen to do my history paper. I'm like, so I did, like, I had a, 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 over a dozen, I think, that I was the official mentor, and then there were several more that I was actually given advice to help come up with a question. So I think she's really put, starting with this year's seniors and with you guys, she's really put the emphasis on spread it out, you know, try something different, you know, do a Spanish. Good luck doing a Spanish E. That's really hard because you have to actually do it in Spanish. But a lot of you guys are doing, in addition to English, science, Whatever, if you're capstone, you're doing it on your capstone project, okay? That's what your extended essay is. But for those of you guys, and I think, let me see, one of you's in here. Mrs. Rao told me that there were three who got their paperwork in time. They're going for the IB diploma, so they'll be doing IB history, and they uh, put in a request for me, and so, yes, right? If you're a little bit late on the game or whatever, you've got some other kinds of uh, interest and it has to do with history and so forth, 
I will help you come up with the question because that's, that's the most important part. I know in the process, she's trying to like get you to guys come through in the question part. The biggest thing is make sure you have enough material and, and you guys are in good shape as far as like your IAs, you've been through that. If you have enough material, it really helps you write a good IA for history. It's the same thing in extended essay. You need to know you have enough resources there in order to, whatever the topic is. Although in science, you actually have to like do an, an experiment and uh, I don't know, there's all math. I mean, they're really cool papers. They're really cool, but you need to, you need to talk very carefully with your mentor to make sure that that all comes together because you don't want it to blow up in your face, you know, with one week out before a major du uh, due date and like, oh, I haven't come up with an experiment yet or whatever. So if you're doing anything history related, whether I'm your mentor or not, or social studies-ish and so forth, I can help with coming up with questions on that, okay? Because I think there might have been a couple of folks. All right, questions? That's my news, good or, good or bad. I think maybe for some of you guys it might be at least a little bit of a relief, okay? Because I know you've been asking and I've been putting that off. So again, w unless there's like some unforeseen, I won't say unforeseen because, I don't know, they might give me a contract and go, eh, we're going to pay you half as much. That would be crazy. That's never happened that I've been offered half as much pay as the previous year. If you go back far enough, 20% less. <laughs> but that was, the, that was when the school was going through crazy things. That was before... That was like two principles before your mom. I mean, that was when we were going through, I don't know if you guys were even here. When you were like elementary, oh my gosh. And, and West Ada was trying to shut us down. In truth, they were, because they wanted more pupils. They needed more pupils and so forth. It was, and it was crazy times. So like, yeah, it's like <laughs> pandemic, nothing compared to what North Stars had to go through. And, if some of you guys have got like parents who were on staff back then, ask them, what was it like when they almost shut down North Star? Yeah, the bad old days, yeah. I see a little bit. <laughs> you, but, but you are. You're, you're very close. All right. Questions, comments? Okay. All right. Let's get to this. Um, Alan Turing and the staff came up with some major innovations with respect to um, code breaking. Um, so good on those guys. This is like, I mean, it's massive and so forth. That is just sort of like one little bar, one little teeny tiny component part of your phone right now. But this is a view of part of the first major computer that was used to help um, crack and continually uh, decipher the code that was on there, okay? So, well done, Benedict Cumberbatch. It's always fascinating. I'm going to be sharing with you today and even into t tomorrow. World War II is just, it was just like huge. I mean, if you were growing up during World War II, it would have an impact on your life. With my parents and, and your grandparents, I would imagine, um, you know, asking them about what was like life during World War II and so forth. You know, they went straight from the Depression, the massive economic depression, right into World War II. And they gutted it out, which is why subsequent generations often refer to them, not disparaging any like <laughs> boomers, um, but refer to them as, do you guys know? The silent generation comes after these guys. Greatest generation. The silent generation was sort of like before that, or actually maybe mean before that, but they're known as like the greatest generation because what do they do? Survive the depression and beat the Nazis. It's pretty good. Yeah, whatever. You know, you guys survive. COVID, I, apparently, I'm like late part of it, whatever, I don't like that, because cause the, the boomer spreads out, and it's like, those are like the Woodstock one, and I'm like, give me a break, I'm not boomer, Woodstock, I was in elementary school, you know, I wasn't like hanging out in some rain-drenched infested field up in New York, doing things that were not necessarily good for my health and so forth, yeah. So it's like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they always do, but you like, you still put it back and just, okay. I, I mean, I love the retort that the younger generations have come up with. It's like, blah, 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 blah. Okay, boomer. We'll see how your health care works, you know, when we're in charge of, like, all of the government administration. Let me see, do I get to that one yet? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Torpedo bombers. 
thing of the ship, the kamikaze. Talk about that. Okay, this is what I wanted to point out. As far as like explosives, and I've got it on. I don't actually have a video of incendiary explosives or other high explosives, but write this down. Incendiary, do you see that? Anybody have any idea what an incendiary explosive is? It's, a, it's an explosive. Thank you. Brilliant. It's an explosive that explodes. It's dropped from a bomb, and it really intends not to necessarily just blow things up, but to burn them to a crisp. Incendiary bombs are very, very destructive. Uh, they were used quite a bit by the Allies. Japan got to be on the receiving end of incendiary bombs. In other words, it's like, don't just blow up the building. Create a firestorm so that the buildings all come toppling down. So even if you don't hit, have a direct hit on a building, you start a fire, and then the whole place burns up. Some of the target, you can write this down, Dresden, which is a city in Germany, that was the payback that the uh, Allies came up with, um, thinking of Coventry, that was like the, uh, you know, the city that the Germans bombed, and the, the Allies, remember this, the Allies had cracked the code, they knew that Coventry was going to be hit, but why didn't they evacuate? Because the Germans wouldn't know that the code was cracked. So the Allies hit Dresden, a very beautiful, I want to say like a medieval type city, and it, there was a firestorm. You're like, oh, I'm safe. I can go down into the basement. Well, guess what happens in the basement of your building? You don't get blown up. You have all the oxygen sucked out as you're baked in there um, because all the oxygen is sucked out into the firestorm above. Yeah. Incendiary. Tokyo. More people. You can put this down. More people were killed in a series of bombings of Tokyo. Over 100,000 people killed in Tokyo which had lots of wood structures built over a long period of time. Tokyo was a major target for the United States, bombing raids. More people were killed there than the individual bombing of Hiroshima or Nagasaki with the nuclear weapons. Incendiary bombs. Yeah. And of course, so those are, you know, those are like improvements <laughs> on typical conventional warfare. Yeah. When we get to the Vietnam War next year, we'll see that there's all kinds of new, neat little things that are dropped from the sky that could, like, it just lands, it's like a flaming jelly thing. <laughs> Napalm. Yeah. The French will start using that in the war in Algeria in the 1950s, and the United States will use a lot of napalm. And it's not just to, like, burn everything to a crisp in, uh, in the jungle. It's also to, like, destroy, you know the leaves on the trees. Sometimes it'll be even more nasty because we'll just drop a little thing called Agent Orange, yeah. which is not somebody working for the United States government. It's actually the name of a defoliant. You drop it on like a tropical forest so people can't hide in there like the enemy, and all it does is just like kill. But it's just kind of like, you know, <laughs> if you do enough like uh, weed killing using chemicals in your yard, eventually that might not be good for you. You know, maybe some of you guys are aware of like the Roundup lawsuits because Roundup was like a, a weed killer kind of thing that was used. But, um, but a lot of people like got cancer from that, so now they're suing the manufacturers of Roundup. Well, Agent Orange was used in war, and it was dropped over lots of areas of Vietnam. But if you are in the Marine Corps and you go into an area that has had a lot of Agent Orange, you're like, well, it's easier to see where the enemy was or is, but you're also breathing that in. So my father-in-law died earlier than he would have otherwise uh, because of uh, two, three tours of duty in the, in the uh, Vietnam War. He was a Marine Corps, and yeah, it impacted his breathing. Smoking didn't help, but the Agent Orange also contributed uh, to an early death. So stuff, yeah, improvements in war. So rockets are really, rockets are kind of annoying. The Germans, as we pointed out last time, make sure we understand this, the V1 and the V2 rockets are going to be rocket innovations of the Germans. Allies really don't have anything like it. This is the German engineering, German science, German physics. Hello? Hello? Okay, maybe they're listening. Hmm. Alexa, be quiet. Um, the thing about a, a V2 or a V1 rocket, you can't send Spitfires and Hurricanes up in the sky to shoot them down. They're ballistic. They go up, and then they come down like an arc. Not the most precise thing, it's kind of like a mortar shell. Pew! Boom! 
Later, when we get to the latter part of the 20th century, we'll see some really cool weaponry that you send up, and it like flies, and it comes right in on the target with precision. Boom! Sorry. Anyway, it's like a little airplane. Those are called cruise missiles, but those haven't been developed yet. Okay, those are innovations. So there's all kinds of interesting innovations. So it's like today in war, people would be really mad at the United States if we like did a traditional, I'll just drop a bunch of bombs on them. Because if you kill a bunch of collateral damage, you know, you know, orphanages and, you know, milk factories and things like that, people are like, shame on you. You should have just hit, like, the precise targets. I'm like, oh, that's right. We do have the precision ability to do that. Okay? Yeah. So, way to go, Germans that came up with that. They came up with a jet fighter. We talked about that as well, um, which is a huge innovation. And then, of course, this. Let's really hone in on this. I'm going to show you a little video clip. The Manhattan Project, write this down. The Manhattan Project is a major United States government effort to research in the area of nuclear science for the purposes of coming up with a weapon. There is a clear understanding on the part of uh, physicists, Albert Einstein included, and he played a key role. He was not part of the Manhattan Project. I don't know if he even would have wanted to be. But there were other scientists, really good scientists, some of them from Europe, <coughs> who understood that a nuclear reaction in an atom could yield a lot of energy. And if you're able to set off a nuclear reaction in, say, some unstable atom like uranium or plutonium, you could get a really big amount of energy, as in an explosion. By the way, there's also peaceful uses. You can get a lot of energy from that and run things along electric wires. And you'll see later on, and we'll point out in this unit, Idaho was the first place that had the peaceful development of nuclear energy. So like when my dad was in Congress and his district included uh, the site, the Idaho National Laboratory is what it's called now, uh, over by ARCO, he, was, he, he became <laughs> brilliant. He was like, I think I'm going to become as smart on nuclear science as I possibly can so that I can advocate on behalf of this site that is located in the district. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh, no, no. It's a major employer for people in uh, Idaho Falls. Yeah, it's like the number one. Those are good jobs. But, you know, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta know what you're doing. I mean, yeah, Atomic City, yeah. Yeah, but it's not a ghost town. Oh, my gosh, no. But you can't just go like, can I go look around wherever I want? No, I mean, it's, you know top security. But having said that, write this down, the Manhattan Project is a top security thing. We put in tons of money. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Do you think anybody is interested in finding out what, what we're up to? Do you know who actually found out, they weren't supposed to, found out a lot of what we were doing on our nuclear project? Soviets. Oh, yeah, I mean, you have to, yeah, I mean, it turns out it's dangerous. And in the early days of, like, nuclear science and so forth, I mean, even some of the great nuclear scientists, uh, like Madame Curie and so forth, who did this kind of stuff, she died of nuclear poisoning. You're like, oh, it's glowing. <laughs> I'm not feeling good. You know, there's a reason, though, those things kind of had that warm feel to it, because they're emitting radiation. Is radiation good for you in large amounts? No. <laughs> you have to be careful. Yeah, that's why, like, when you go in for, like, some kind of a heavy, you know, anybody has ever actually gone in for, like, an x-ray and so forth, and everybody else hides behind this, like, lead barriers, and you're like, sure, go ahead, take a picture, I'll smile, just don't take too many. <laughs> yeah, anyway, but, I mean, it's all important. The Soviets, write it down, because we're going to see this, the Soviets had multiple spies in the Manhattan Project. Later, near, like, near the end of the war, after Roosevelt died and Truman took over as president, he was vice president, like, whoa, I had no idea this was going on. Oh, and they work? And he's getting ready to use them, and he talks to Joseph Stalin, he's like, I got a really big weapon, and Joseph Stalin's kind of like, exactly, seriously, yeah, we know. Yeah, which is going to be a problem, because the Soviets are going to really advance their nuclear weapons development on the basis of not only their science, because they're good at science, they put a lot of effort into it, 
but also spycraft. They're going to get key pieces of information from our Manhattan Project. What did the Manhattan Project ultimately lead? Yield? Bombs. Bombs that worked. Write this down. The Germans were already out of the war. VE Day, this is why things are very important. VE Day, May 8, 1945, Hitler's out. Okay? Europe, the war in Europe is done. We had developed it in the light of the fact that maybe the Nazis would have been able to develop nuclear weapons first, and that could have really turned the tide. And you think Hitler would have used those against his opponents? Heck yeah. Heck yeah. It would have been really, really bad. One of the things, you can write this down, that prevented them from doing that was effective espionage by the United States and, and uh, sabotage. I think they had some like heavy water facilities and so forth in Norway, and we're like, let's get some guys in there to mess it up. And then, of course, strategic bombing. Any place that they had any kind of factory or any kind of thing going on for their war effort, we bombed the heck out of, and all the neighborhoods nearby. Okay? So strategic bombing helped us quite a bit. Meanwhile, our development is going on safely back in the United States in places like Chicago and Los Alamos, New Mexico. The first test, successful test, was in July of 1945. The Trinity test. I'm going to show you a little video here. The Trinity test. It worked. Um, I don't think I have the date specifically. I want to say July. And so we knew that it worked. Uh, we actually knew that two different types worked. We ultimately had Fat Man and Little Boy. One was a plutonium bomb. One was a, um, a, a uranium bomb. We didn't tell the Japanese that we only had developed one of each by that time. We could have developed more, but I mean, you know, come on. Hello, how many IAs do you have to have, you know, by the due date? Um, and so it's very, very interesting, isn't it, Noah? Very interesting and controversial. What should the United States do when we got two nuclear bombs and we know they work? Should we use them against the Japanese? Should we tell them ahead of time? Should we notice? I mean, their whole IA that Noah's doing is on those very, very important implications. But know this. Write this down. When the uh, bomb on Hiroshima was dropped, I want to say August 6th, 1945, Hiroshima was hit without a warning. And then we hit Nagasaki... What was it? Help me out on this one, Noah. You're the expert. Like three or four? Afterwards. And so we hit Nagasaki, okay? And then we were waiting for the response from the Japanese. As in, are they going to fight tooth and nail to defend their home islands against an amphibious assault from the United States of America? Or are they going to quit? They quit. But write this down. They did get a... Uh, a provision that they wanted. They got to keep their emperor. Okay? And when we go in, and we'll talk about this afterwards, when we go in and kind of like take charge of Japan, got the emperor, and then we'll create a constitution for them that's like a constitutional democracy. Okay? So let's take a look. I'm going to show you this uh, real quick clip here of what it would have looked like. Oh my gosh, that's not the one. No. We did that. Oh, here it is. Okay. Because those guys haven't had that yet. With American casualties mounting as they fight across the Pacific, island to island. The American assault on Iwo Jima sees some of the bloodiest fights in the war. Yeah, we talked about this. Thousands of Japs. Propaganda.
populated only by rattlesnakes and tarantulas. Scientists Which were evacuated. For the first ever test of atomic bomb. There were two versions of the bomb. There was the little boy and the fat man. Now the little boy Sound like ice cream the bomb sandwiches. And the fat man is the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. Careful with that. The uranium fueled little boy will work. But now you need to test the plutonium fueled fat man. The reason for running the test on the fat man was that plutonium was a brand new element that had never been known before. How far do you get back if you're going to be observing? <laughs> Setting the universe on fire. Hmm. Hope it doesn't do that. Before the test, the plutonium core of the bomb, the size of an orange, arrives from the Los Alamos laboratory. Look at it. The orange is in the car in this car. Check this out. There it is. It's in the cart. <laughs> Warm. Oh, and then a little stupid commercial. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's talk about some other components. Obviously, we're going to be talking about nuclear weapons all the way until the present. We still do. <laughs> What's North Korea up to? <laughs> developing nuclear weapons. But it's okay. You know, what do they get, like a nuclear hand grenade? No, they're developing rocket technology so that it can hit the United States. Uh, good thing we have a baseball bat to protect us and hit it back at them in case it ever gets close. No. But we do have some development of defense. These are going to be issues that are going to be very much with us. So when I was in high school, um, <laughs> they actually stopped doing nuclear uh, war uh, raids because they would just freak children out. You know, duck and cover, get under the table like you're going to be safe. No, that would just freak people out. No. No. I mean, in, in growing up outside of Washington, D.C., I knew if we ever had nuclear war, it would be like, Goodbye, you know? They would have had at least two or three nuclear weapons dedicated toward us. We will be talking about nuclear weapons from here on out. It ended World War II in Japan, um, but it is going to be a major component of the way things work, and it's still today. I mean, it's still. Do you, who do you not want to have nuclear weapons? Would you be okay with Kim Jong-un having nuclear weapons? No, he's already got them. How about the Iranians? They're trying to get them, okay? Everywhere, so many different places. When I was your age, and even still today, opponents have 
multiple weapons dedicated to, mul to plenty of targets. Hundreds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a thing called nuclear winter. If the United States and the Soviet Union ever got into a war, even still today, with Russia or China and so forth, there'd be enough nuclear explosions going off everywhere that eventually all the trade winds would carry all that radioactive poison and it would ultimately cover the entire planet Earth. So, like, we're literally, when people say hashtag World War III, I mean, that's it. It's over. It's not just like World War II. World War II had nuclear weapons at the end in one particular component part. Ugh, yeah, sorry. And then we're done for. Yeah, um, let's put it this way. I think the United States was smart enough. I haven't heard too much about, like, too many people um, that were impaired. Soviet nuclear tests, those were really messed up. They were like, let's do a nuclear test and let's pretend it's part of an actual military campaign. So they would send their soldiers rushing in toward ground zero where the explosion took place as though we're going to take this land over. No, you learn very quickly. You stay away from that spot because it's going to be radioactive. And even then, still, the United States were like, well, let's test these things to make sure that they work. Boom, boom, boom. Where do they do most of the tests? Delaware or like Nevada? Nevada, right, because you want to do it somewhere where there's not a lot of people. But as you do them above the surface, boo, look at that cloud, boo, look at that cloud. Where do clouds go? They blow in the wind, and all the stuff that's in the cloud drops down onto Idaho and other downwind locations, which is why people, more boomers, more than me, they were growing up in Idaho in the late 50s and early 60s, they have an increased amount of thyroid cancer because all the radioactive stuff was falling on the grass, eaten by the cows, and then kids drink your milk. And so they would get a little high uh, dose of um, radioactive stuff in those developing years. We don't do above ground testing anymore. We do below ground testing, which is good, because you just go boom, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what happens. All right, let's see. Yeah, let's get to this one. Lend-lease. Let me say a couple of things about lend-lease. Do you see that right here? Um, we talked tactics, strategies, we talked about the second bullet point, we talked about German Blitzkrieg already, we talked about strategic bombing. Lend-lease, this isn't so much explosion as in the United States gives money to allies before their allies and even after their allies. This is interesting. This is why I think maybe Hitler was predisposed to be like, yeah, United States, we know that you're already not playing it fair. Make sure you write this down. You'll see this as well in your chapter. President Roosevelt did all he could to try and help the British. Write that down. President Roosevelt is doing all he could with the support of Congress to help the British. So you can see here, what is that, like $9.3 billion of aid to the British to help them. Now, critics would say, well, it looks like you're kind of like not really being a neutral country, United States of America. And some of that is going to come after the United States is officially at war with Germany. Okay? This is a project that the United States does um, to help. So, for example, some of it looks all fair because the British are like, we need more naval vessels. And the United States has got a whole bunch of destroyers. Well, how could destroyers? Danton, how could destroyers help the British Navy? Exactly. Very good. Yeah, you get, you get some sonar on there, you get some uh, depth charges and so forth, you're going to have more protection for all the ships going across. So we leased these destroyers, or we lended them anyway. Oh, when we leased, write this down, uh, like the British Virgin Islands. So we got some control of some Caribbean islands in exchange for giving the British what they really needed, which was ships. And then there'll be other financial aid, military aid, and so forth as the war goes on. We do that also with the Soviets. I think they're the second biggest recipient of aid from the United States. Of course, it's controversial because, you know, we've only got so much money, but we do have all these destroyers and we're not using them. And Roosevelt figured out a way to give assistance to what would ultimately become 
our allies in the European war. Okay? Yeah. Yes. All right. These ones, we've actually seen and talked about the third bullet point, uh, battles and uh, fighting on the air, land, and sea. There is a visual of Operation Barbarossa, which was the ultimate German campaign against the Soviets, which failed, ultimately, in the sense that the Germans lost against the Soviet Union. There's the evacuation of Dunkirk. You can see the German troops surrounding uh, the British and French uh, forces, but thank goodness for all the little boats that came across and, and evacuated most all of the British troops. Okay? Obviously, here we've got uh, December 7th, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor, the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, that the United States was kind of sort of maybe anticipating since we did cut off oil to the Japanese, which they saw as not really being fair. The Battle of Midway, I'll show a clip here. Um, this was the one that we talked about in the Pacific where we were able to spy and identify where their aircraft carriers were. Lucky us, because then we were able to hit them with some of our aircraft. Um, and I'll show you the clip from the movie, Midway. And they did, I saw one in the 70s, it was okay, but with modern technology, there were even more uh, better ways of kind of showing you what's going on here. Let me, I'm going to do a whole bunch of these ones now. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that off because I don't want to get copyright blocked. Right, Trevor? Because they'll do that. YouTube. <laughs> 